appreciate all of you for being here. Um, we have a great rock star panel of folks from Los Angeles to talk about universal basic mobility. Um, first, we have Jillian Gillette, program manager of the California Integrated Mobility at Caltrans. <laughs> then we have Rebecca Gutierrez, uh, vice president of marketing and public relations at Blink Charging. Um, Marcel Porras, uh, Chief Sustainability Officer at LADOT. Excellent. And uh, Zahira Mann, President and CEO of Slate Z. And I'm just going to stay here for a moment and then ask questions. Um, so universal basic mobility is the idea that everyone should have access to safe and affordable transportation options. UBM looks at both the supply of sustainable options in our communities, but also ensuring that folks have the information and the money to take advantage of those options. Los Angeles has been a leader in defining the concept of universal basic mobility, uh, as well as advancing the strategies that UBM can look like in our communities. So today, excited to hear from some of the thought leaders, the implementors, and the, the leading edge of defining UBM for Los Angeles and specifically thinking about what are some of the strategies and lessons learned that could be replicable um, and useful in other cities thinking about similar concepts. So uh, first, I'm going to start with a question to Zahira. Um, do you agree with this sort of definition of UBM? Um, and uh, UBM in, in your community, how does UBM work in creating welcoming spaces that allow communities to thrive? Thank you so much for that question, and thank you for allowing me to be here today to have this conversation. Um, I'm really excited to dive into this because this has been such a critical issue for our community. Um, so a little bit uh, about Slate Z to explain our community a bit to help understand this. Um, but the South Los Angeles Transit Empowerment Zone, or Slate Z, is one of the 22 federally designated promise zones throughout the country that are focused on addressing poverty in high poverty, uh, low income communities, um, and looking at those communities in urban, rural, and tribal areas. Um, so it's really lovely because we're part of a network where we get to hear what's happening in other areas and share best practices and share stories. We were formed by partners like Los Angeles uh, Trade Technical College, the City of Los Angeles, LA Promise Fund, Coalition for Responsible Community Development, and we're really a cross-sector partnership. We have around 100 partners that we work with in doing this work, and we also work with small businesses and residents as we're carrying out all of these various efforts. So yes, I very much agree with this definition of UBM. Um, it is innovative, and its innovation in many ways leads us to a very like back to the basics way of operating and way of thinking. And we hear that directly from the community. So there are lots of times where we think innovation has to have a lot of other elements that are added to it. And listening to the community really means that when what they're saying is innovative is please give us something that allows us to access transit um, in ways that are easy and simple that we listen to them. Um, when we don't make it overly complex and overly difficult for them to be able to execute uh, what they need. And I think that it also helps us answer the questions of how we get around a community. How do we ensure that communities thrive? And overwhelmingly, the benefits of the green economy are not truly felt in a lot of low income and working class communities. And having pieces like this, um, so we're working on a universal basic mobility pilot in South Los Angeles with LADOT. LADOT is leading it with fun funding from the California Air Resources Board. And I'll let LADOT and Marcel go into more detail about that. Um, but that particular piece of work then allows us to really ensure that what people need transit for. They need transit for getting to jobs, getting to school, getting to childcare facilities. Um, they also need it to get to the grocery store and to ensure that they can get to the doctor's office. All of those become critical pieces to how they're operating and how they're using transit. And for part of our work in terms of this pilot, what we're doing is we're working with the resident advisory committee. So we've brought together a group of residents who we've been trained and who are all participating. Um, we have also are convening a steering committee, and that steering committee includes residents, it includes members from elected offices, um, including three council districts, two supervisorial districts, the LA Department of City Planning, so it's pretty comprehensive. In addition to the various grantee partners and a series of community-based organizations. 
And what that does is then ensure that we are listening to lots of different stakeholders, most importantly the community, so there are 10 of these residents who are part of the steering committee, to be able to hear feedback of how is this work moving forward. There's also a component where we're working with um, community-based organizations who are ambassadors for carrying out the work and being able to implement it. And our work with UBM doesn't end with the grant. It really is incorporated into lots of other pieces of our organization and lots of other parts of our work. So for example, one of the projects that we've been working on with LADOT and Metro and others um, is around transformative climate communities where, again, we're looking at mobility options, um, things like fearless transit, things like a bike share program, um, and other elements that then expand upon um, UBM and then also further leverage um, the pieces that we're already doing in terms of the CARB efforts. But ultimately, what is so great about, I think, where we are in this moment of this work, of understanding what the definition is and then understanding the simplicity in some ways of some of the solutions, is that we have cross-sector partners who are listening to the community, truly listening. And they're listening first and then acting second. And that shift that is occurring is ensuring that we will hopefully see better outcomes than we've ever seen before because it's efforts that are authentic to what the community needs and we have the people built into the process who ensure their success, which is the community. Um, and so, that work has been incredible work and very gratifying um, and then also just further speaks to the needs that are within our community where mobility options are essential from because it really there are so many people who either don't have cars or they take transit to work or um, their mobility options are limited just based on how much how much they have in terms of resources and by opening up these options really opens up the rest of the world for them. Oh, I love that so much. Thank you for sharing that. And I love this idea too of using this UBM pilot as a new way of operating and thinking first about community needs and then designing programs around them. That's something that LADOT has been working on for some time. So I'm curious, Marcel, to hear from you how you're thinking about the, the words of the community and then also what are the clear outcomes and metrics and KPIs that you've designed the STEP program around? Yeah, thank you um, for that question and thank you, Zahira, for, for, for setting the stage, right? Because I think it is important, like the city has a role, um, the, the leadership of the city, the mayor, the city council, um, and then us at, at LADOT as the implementers, and I think uh, we were very beneficial to have like, really solid leadership um, through by having um, Salida Reynolds as our general manager, who really, I think, um, put um, LADOT staff and culture at the kind of like at, at the front of the agenda, knowing that if we were going to achieve transformative change in, in, in projects and work closely with community members, that we really needed to be thoughtful about um, how, we, how we got there. And I think that when we're asking, when I ask myself, how did we get here in terms of the CARB Step Grant, um, I think there's a lot of different pieces that people um, and organizations took on in order to enable this. Um, I think when we talk about looking for the first time at vision, implementing a Vision Zero agenda to eliminate Traffic fatality, it was, a, it was a citywide comprehensive approach looking at where traffic uh, violence was happening in our city and creating a toolbox for how to mitigate those impacts. And so um, in addition to working with um, strategies um, in terms of like dignity infused um, outreach with community stakeholders, it really kind of set the model for how we engage, um, I believe. But it was done through just the lens of traffic safety and vision zero. So I think that um, what we, we saw through leadership like and the formation of Slate Z, um, as well as funding opportunities that were established by the state for these competitive grant projects, to think more comprehensively and really look at centering the community and kind of decision making, um, that I think really was the impetus um, for us applying for the CARB STEP grant. Um, I have the good fortune to have been in my work uh, for the past 15 years working in the city at various levels um, as a council deputy for Councilmember Garcetti in his mayor's office and now in DOT and in every role um, I've been working on transportation and so um, you know 
a little bit of my work initially, I think starting from like 2015, 2016, was really about innovating on kind of new shared mobility um, projects. Bike sharing, dockless mobility, EV car sharing, which we'll talk a little bit about as well. Um, and, and then also starting to talk about stuff like autonomous vehicles and, uh, and UAM, like um, advanced aerial mobility, which I think if you all remember, that was like the craze like five years, like they were gonna happen. Like right, right now, it'd be a shock that you didn't get here on an air taxi, you know, to the, to, to the event today. Yeah, you know, and so, um, but I think then something happened, right? The pandemic happened. And it really, I think, um, it, it, it accelerated or it, 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 it demonstrated like who's being impacted by this most, right? We saw specific line, uh, transit lines that were still near um, the same type of utilization. It was all the folks, you know, coming from South LA or from the north, north, Northeast San Fernando Valley who were still look, using the service to get to their jobs. And so for me, it was kind of this, this, this light that kind of this opportunity where I, I saw this grant come out and I talked to Salida, our general manager at the time. I'm like, I think this is where we need to pivot to. And we were already doing this work. And so she said, go. And um, we had partners. We had partners that we just reached out to. Metro was one of those partners. Lacey was one of those partners. Uh, Slate Z was one of those partners. Um, and Slate Z had already been doing that work and was actually in the midst of a planning grant um, from the, transform, from the Transforming Climate Communities. And so we were able to kind of really come together in a partnership to say, hey, what if we put this project mixed together, um, but it's gotta, we gotta win, right? And so there was, there was the community piece, but there was a, a technical rigor that we were able to provide to make sure that we delivered a, a, a strong project, which we did, and we, and we got. And, um, but initially, they only gave us half of it. <laughs> we're like, oh no, we want 14 million. They gave us seven million, um, and eventually they saw the light and gave us the other seven million. Um, hum humble brag. Yeah, and <laughs> and so um, and we're now in the midst of that work, which is a, it's a lot of little pieces. Um, you know, you see the demographics up there of the project area. Um, Zahira mentioned that w we also received now a Transforming Climate Communities grant for the South LA Eco Lab, which builds on some of the elements that we have in STEP. But I think it's a more comprehensive approach um, to delivering solutions to a community that's been long time overlooked, right? And so um, it's only th the work and the investment that both of those grant projects pull together is still a fraction of the investment that we actually believe is needed um, to really kind of right the, the wrongs that have been um, that have been made over time from you know kind of racist policies that um, that, that we've we've suffered from right and so um, you know now we're excited when we talk about metrics you know some of it is about um, just first of all learning we have a, we have a series because we have like seven different projects with it and we might get into each and every one of it but some of it is just community based right like how do you measure you know, in, you know, training a resident, you know, and having them participate, I, you know, like, um, but yeah, we do have metrics, like how many, how many bike trips are gonna happen? How many Blue LA EV car sharing trips are gonna happen? Um, how many people are gonna use the mobility wallet to, you know, access a job versus access a recreational opportunity? And so we, we are thinking about those things, but we also realize, wow, we can't do this all ourselves, and so, We've, we're partnering with folks. So um, I know UCLA is in the room, Maddie Brozen, um, you know, UC Davis is also a partner in there. And so we're looking at academia to really lean in and help us. Um, because at the end of the day, um, we're not doing the pilot for the sake of the pilot. We're doing it so that we can affect change and not just in people's day-to-day -day lives, but we also have this responsibility. We've got to figure out how are we going to fund this, right, over the long term. And so again, it's just a really exciting opportunity and collaboration um, that takes a lot of people and I, I feel like in as much as we have, you know, we need more, right? We need more bodies, we need everyone here, we need the private sector to say, hey, how can I support, how can I be there? Um, and so we're, again, we're just excited and happy to talk about this program. Ooh, thank you for that. That's very exciting and um, very inspiring, to be honest, about the way that the city has reframed its thinking from the projects to the outcomes that um, they wanna see in the ground, in the community and in people's lives. 
one of those components of universal basic mobility then is the infrastructure on the ground that people can have access to. And I think an increasing recognition that people are making choices about trips and travel every day, and we need to have more options available for them to meet those, those needs. And one of the options that you mentioned is Blue LA and electric vehicle car sharing. It's something that the city has been a pioneer in and a, I think a key piece of the South LA project. So Rebecca, I'd love to hear a bit from you on sort of what has been the, um, the role of the public funding and the support that you've seen from the LA um, in the services that are available here in the city. Sure, absolutely. Um, so for anyone who might not be familiar, um, Blink Mobility, powered by Blue LA, is um, a partnership with uh, Blink Mobility and also the city, uh, through some grant funds as we're discussing, um, for electric car sharing. So these are um, station-based car sharing uh, charged by the minute. There are two programs. There's one for just the general public, and then there's a community program as well, which is um, significantly reduced costs. So um, very inexpensive opportunities for the community to go in um, and rent a car for the time they need it and return it, and um, also bring to the community who may not otherwise have the opportunity, a chance to actually experience an electric vehicle as well. Um, obviously, California is leading the way in um, in looking at um, electrification of our transportation. And this is a big part of it, getting people in those cars, getting the community in these cars and understanding what they really are. Uh, it's a very exciting program for us. Um, the funding is super important as a private industry. It is difficult sometimes to do some of these um, organ um, projects and starting a business altogether that uh, it's gonna take a little bit longer to become fully operationally profitable. Um, so the, these kinds of fundings really allow us to take our time, get the program right, uh, serve the community, and actually understand how people are gonna need it and use it, and then also have these different membership levels so that people can, to use it to the extent that they can uh, afford as well. Because the, the whole premise of UBM, right, is to help people be in motion and be able to uh, do what they need to do through mobility, whether it's an electric vehicle or a scooter or a transit. Um, we really believe that people should have these options. So uh, it's a great thing for us to do. We spend a lot of time in the community. We spend a lot of time talking to neighborhoods, understanding if this is a service that would work for them and for their residents and their businesses, uh, and really get involved. And, and this funding actually allows us to take that time and really get it right for the city. No, that's great. And then, Jillian, I want to bring you in, especially as we've been talking quite a bit about the transformative role that mobility can have um, in allowing folks access to their communities. Uh, um, but I know you've been doing quite a lot of thinking about uh, mobility as a financial inclusion pathway um, to allow folks not just access to their community, but access to all of the benefits and services and, and opportunities within our communities. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your work on that um, from the statewide perspective. Sure. Do I have to use the microphone? Can you hear me if I talk? Yes. OK, good. Um, so uh, thanks. That's super exciting. So. So at the state, well, uh, well Jillian, I'm so sorry, but there's people watching online, so oh, you do are. have to use the little thing. I have to use the micro. Okay, I'll use it. Um, so let's see. The way I think about mobility is as upward mobility. So I always sort of think that um, you can kind of judge how democratic a society is by how easy it is for women and children to get around. Um, and that's not particularly true in the United States. We've got a built environment that's really difficult to navigate. Um, and it's really difficult for you know poor people, which tends to more often be women than men, uh, and children certainly are, are very dependent in our society. So we're not doing a great job democratically in, by, my, by my measurement, uh, and uh, upward mobility is pretty, pretty limited. So um, the state has a problem with, uh, it's really hard for us to give out money um, because we still have a lot of paper-based systems and we have a lot of programs that have a lot of rules and we don't succeed very well at getting the money out quickly or to the right people. Um, and so an example would be at the federal government when Trump sent out the Trump checks, the people who, you know, we all got our money the next day through direct deposit. 
because um, most of us probably have a direct deposit relationship with the IRS. But poor people, the most poor people in the United States actually got um, paper checks once they figured out how to apply for the money. And so the average household that got a paper check who needed the money the most spent close to $400 in check cashing fees to, to get their $1,400. So <clears throat> even when we give money out, we're not doing it particularly well. So what I'm trying to focus on using the other mobility, which is transportation services, is to make sure that everybody in California has a basic account. Um, so we have a tendency in uh, transit to, uh, if you're a small agency, you accept exact change only. That's how it is mostly in California. You have to come up with exact change, which is kind of like telling most Americans that you don't want them as a customer, right? <laughs> Um, it's, it's true, uh, uh, and that's a problem. So we need to digitize all government services, right? The, the internet is here, it's been here for some time. The private sector, even banks have, digi have digitized and removed a lot of paper. And the rate at which that's happening is accelerating. So um, transit needs to get on the bank rails. You need to be able to pay for transit directly on a fare gate or on a point of sale terminal on a bus with a debit or credit card, preferably a debit card because then you get into less financial trouble. But, um, but not everybody has a debit card and that's a big problem in the United States. Um, but it, uh, it's true that now there are payment providers who are willing to issue debit cards to um, folks who don't who can't maintain a minimum balance in a bank, in a bank card, because in fact, payments and banking are separate industries. So we've been working with companies like the Cash App and PayPal and Venmo and other payment issuers. When we help a transit agency in California go open loop, that is to put point of sale terminals on their bus, door, bus or train doors, we always try to bring a payment issuer with us um, and ask the transit provider and their, and their uh, board of directors to help give people information about these other debit products to encourage people um, to sign up for them so that they can basically become banked. Um, so uh, one statistic, and then I'll shut up, is uh, we, uh, last year, we, we, our premier first agency is Monterey Salinas Transit in, in, in Monterey. So Monterey is a wealthy tourist town, but it's mostly, um, the people who work there come from Salinas, which is also an, an agricultural town. So the, hot the hospitality workers like to get paid in cash, and they get mugged at the bus stops. <laughs> um, uh, and then a lot of the uh, agri uh, agriculture workers in Salinas don't have any bank accounts at all. So we brought the Cash App with us in Monterey um, when we started uh, with them last year. So between May and August of last year, 30% um, of the Cash App's new customers in the transit service area were directly attributable to this project, meaning the very first time the customer used the Cash App was to tap on a Monterey Salinas bus. By the end of that period, 93% of the transactions of those same customers were um, not for transit, that 93% were th for things like food. So you can really use transit as a way to bring folks into the financial uh, ecosystem and use the power of the state to make sure that they're better and safer products for the under and unbanked. And once we do that, um, or as we're doing that, it will make us it easier for us to um, allow the underbanked and unbanked customers to get credit for the investments that we're making in them already, which currently are sort of scattered all over in different you know, bespoke programs that government tends to build. Um, because <coughs> there, the new issuers, like the Cash App and PayPal and Venmo, will give you credit based on data about you. They use different ways to trust you than the traditional banking model, which is pretty um, racist. <laughs> Uh, so the new issuers will use other debit stream, uh, other data streams, like a government benefit program. Um, so we think that that uh, we, we're seeing that being successful in the transit with the transit agencies that we're working on, and it'll be great to um, try to bring those tools to you know areas like yours and find out what do women and children want to do, where do they want to go, uh, and if that that requires the basic plumbing of payment, um, it, then we want to make sure that they have access to that. Should I go?
Amazing. Um, well, I wanted to then talk on this payment question then, since half of the equation is really uh, somewhat novel, but also why didn't we think of this before, of paying people for the mobility that they need. So I'm curious um, for folks on the, the panel, um, you know, is this mobility wallet component of UBM essential, or is it more of a nice to have when you think about the investments and the overall program that's happening in South LA? Um, so I think, um, I think one of the things to know is, are we providing subsidies for just the sake of providing subsidies for mobility, right? Is the goal mobility or is the goal access to opportunity, right? And, and, who, and who is that for? What, what community is that for? Well, I think, um, I think for LADOT and the city, it's like where we were prioritizing our investments. And really, again, building off of the pandemic, um, that really is looking at disadvantaged communities. Um, the state has defined those through the Cal Enviro screen, and it's not just socioeconomic, but it's exposure to GHG, right? Um, but again, it's not just mobility for the sake of mobility. It's like, how do you create access to opportunities? We believe transit is, is the lifeline, and is, you know, there's nothing that is gonna be more efficient, more environmentally sustainable than mass transit, and Metro is already doing a huge job in, in that realm, right? Um, but so is LADOT. LADOT has the second largest transit fleet uh, in the county uh, with our dash buses and our commuter express buses. During the pandemic, we made dash free and it still remains free, right? And as, as, as a core lifeline. Um, but I think the work that we're doing with the mobility wallet isn't just about LADOT, it's also about Metro, right? And as a, one of our key partners, um, we're really using the mobility wallet to test how that relationship between mass transit that Metro provides, the circulator service that we provide, and other options. Because through work that we've done around gender equity, um, around racial equity, we know that people um, can't just depend on transit, right? Um, the bus shelter, uh, there may not be bus shelter, right? There may not be shade. It may not feel safe. Um, at times, and so um, through these other experiments like Blue LA, um, where 48% of the trips that are happening are happening from the low income user, the community membership, um, that they're being used for things like recreation, for doctor's visits, um, is a key piece of the ecosystem. And for us, is like how can we take the lead and do the heavy lifting of integration to try to create a seamless customer experience um, that benefits you know, those folks that we think need it the most. Um, and so I think the mobility wallet is essential um, in terms of figuring out you know, what the impact is. So I think to get a little bit into the specifics of the mobility wallet, we're actually using two, we're testing two te te technology paths. One with the existing Metro TAP system um, where we have um, found partnerships with different mobility providers who are going to do some software development so that they can integrate. And then we're putting $150 per month for 12 months for 1,000 low-income qualifying members. And then we're gonna see how they use it. At the same time, and the experience that we had again following the city's Guaranteed Basic Income Program, which is the largest GBI program um, in the country, um, we're, we're, we're piggybacking on the Angelino card, which is the way that the city distributed the GBI benefit um, to those qualifying folks. Um, because again, it's about like, is it mobility for the sake of mobility? No, it's, and, and who are we targeting? Well, we're targeting those folks that we think need it the most because again, we're trying to reduce um, some of the financial burdens that folks have, um, which transportation is a key part of that. And so again, with our research partners, we're really trying to understand and, and longitudinally understand what, you know, how that impacts people's use. And with the debit card, they're actually gonna have a wider use and be able to use um, what I think is more mobility solutions because again, it's relying on just the bank, the, the payments um, infra architecture that already is there. So the way we're um, limiting it, um, and again, one of the questions is, um, how much limitation do we put on it is um, by merchant code. And so, you know, really narrowing down 
the type of use that the, the debit card can be spent on. Um, and again, we're just exciting. It's like, whoa, we're gonna learn some stuff, you know? And, and, and it's, a po it's a combination of actually seeing the swipe data and analyzing the swipe data, um, but also we wanna do in-depth surveys. And we wanna hear how it's impacted people. And again, that's where uh, the research partners at UCLA and UC Davis are really gonna be key because that's what they do. I don't, I'm not gonna be good at that. Um, but they're gonna be good at that and then hopefully we can um, have some information that we could share with the city council, with the mayor, um, and then ho hopefully maybe influence federal policy. Um, a portion of these dollars are coming um, from the U.S. Treasury as part of the American Recovery dollars. And so we have the U.S. Treasury auditing us, making sure that what we're doing is, you know, we're eligible to do what we're doing. Um, but again, I think being able to lift this up um, and partner with other cities that are taking this on, such as Pittsburgh, Oakland, um, and a few others who are really focused on this type of work. Anybody other want to add? Good. Well, I was going to just say that um, <clears throat> I really like the idea. Obviously, I'm a f more of a fan of the debit card part of your experiment than the tap card experiment. Because to me, I think making <clears throat> reducing as much friction as possible and giving people the most choice is the best thing. I think that one of the mistakes that government often makes is being so concerned about fraud or control of the pro of a program that we cre create these very special boxes that going back to the democracy, um, the democracy idea is like, it's very paternalistic, right? You can have this card for this, this piece of your life you're allowed to live and here's these special bucks on the you know, government A buck card, right? And here's the other tiny pot of money that you can use. <clears throat> it's kind of humiliating for the, for the recipient and we should stop doing that. Um, you know, because we wind up parsing out all of these cards that give, uh, you know, I've, d people that have heard me before have said, heard me say this, you, you, we give, well-meaning programs produce a Pokemon deck in the wallets of poor people, and, you know, it could take them years to get those benefits back if their wallets get stolen, right? If our wallet gets stolen, we have a debit card, we call the 800 number, we get a new debit card, right? Like, why don't we just give them that? You know, we mean well, we give them all this other crap. <laughs> that is humiliating to use when we, you know, rather than giving them a debit card and figuring out, um, you know, how to also give them money, which is, I think, a lot of what's happening in, in LA. I think, you know, people need a basic way to pay. To deny them the basic plumbing of transacting, in addition to their not having money, is not really done in the rest of the world. <laughs> Frankly, the rest of the world is ahead of us on that, so that's my two cents. No, amazing. And Zahir, I'd love to hear um, from you a bit here as well. We have infrastructure challenges in LA are enormous. Um, and here we are thinking about mobility wallets and, and funding and identity and benefits and all of these other issues. So I'm curious on how, well, sort of how are you explaining the interconnectivity of a lot of this when in your work? And, and what are you hearing from the, the residents and the community members in terms of how this all fits together in their everyday lives and, and could be better in terms of the uh, project outcomes that we're talking about? So thank you for that question. I mean, I think the, the biggest piece is how to make the messaging and the communication as simple as possible. Simple and clear communication is what works for all of us. It's what works for every single person on this planet. And so the more we can do that, the more these types of programs and efforts resonate. Because, you know, as we've been talking about the mobility wallet, you know, to your question, like, yes, it's necessary and it has two purposes. It has a research purpose and it has a utilization purpose. And that research purpose then helps with later utilization in terms of future sustainability to be able to justify like why we even invested in this program to begin with. It's a pilot. And in order to sustain it, you need those pieces. And I think that you know because we were able to bring together a resident advisory committee and we trained them then for 12 weeks. So that training is on civic engagement, how to sit at the same tables with people who are decision makers so that they could feel comfortable and sit shoulder to shoulder with others who typically they're in a very different power dynamic relationship with where they're not able to sit together as colleagues and peers. And we really wanted to break that down so that we could get true, honest communication from them of what is needed. And I would say overwhelmingly what they shared, kind of going back to this level of simplicity, is that the way you communicate this out 
is the way that people just interact within the world. So you communicate it out at outreach events, at places where the community already is, in newsletters that they're already receiving. Like everything is sort of integrated and woven into the way in which someone already lives their lives. And so that is how the most organic way for them to understand and become connected to the program. Um, and we've been hearing that over and over again of the type of information that they, that how they want to receive the information. With the residents, the other piece is for one of the reasons why we did such in-depth training was that they could understand um, and be able to do that translation from the complex, more policy related language into, well, what does this practically mean for your everyday life and how you're going to live it? And they have a translation that needs to be made so that then they could do the most effective form of communication and the simplest, which is mouth to mouth, like just being able to talk to your neighbor and say, this is the program, this is how it works, you know, this is where you sign up. And they could wade through all the information and be able to give a really crisp, clear understanding. But I think that level of simplicity of how we get there is so difficult. And when you're able to get there, we're able to create really beautiful things because now people not only understand a program, but they can start to see themselves in it and they can start to understand how they would practically utilize it. So I think that um, there was an instance where there were lots of different checks that were sending out. I was talking to someone about a program they were implementing and they were saying that the biggest issue was whether or not people actually open up the mail mm -hmm. to get the card or to get the check. So that problem and that barrier goes away once your neighbor has gotten it and opened it up and it was great news. So you're going to then go and look in your mailbox and open it up and hope you have the same great news. Um, but we un underestimate like how powerful just person to person communication is and that really is what is most effective in these types of programs and what we've seen as being most effective in South Los Angeles. Just to follow on uh, both of these points, which are absolutely excellent, um, it really is about making it very simplest and seamless throughout the whole process and fitting it in, fitting uh, the whole concept of mobility into their lives where it's not even something you think about, it's very automatic. So the easier that we can do this, the more successful we'll be. Just as uh, you know, we're looking at where we're gonna have the electric ride share cars, it has to be in the communities where people need them and want them and it fits into their lives where they don't even have to consider going to another alternative. And since the service has been in Los Angeles for a while now, I'm curious too if you have any thoughts on sort of that mouth, mouth to mouth, community to community sort of conversation that the, the locations or even the access to this, the service has sparked. Well, parking's always an issue. No one wants to give up their parking spots. Um, but we do do a great deal of outreach, but in truth, it's never enough. Uh, we always need to be listening and really get the ear of the community. Um, we're definitely continuing that as we're looking to expand the, uh, the service into additional neighborhoods. Um, so far, we also now have data from you know being in the community for quite some time. We have that trip data. We are starting to understand and be able to analyze and build patterns how people use the service. We know the average rental for one of our EVs is uh, three hours, just over three hours. We know that they're running errands. They're going to doctor's appointments. You know, very much everyday things are, are what people are renting our vehicles for. Um, so we, as we're building this out, we need to continue to engage with the community. Uh, we have a steering committee for uh, Blue LA and they go out and represent and speak to the communities in their neighborhoods as well to give us that feedback as well as um, kind of offer suggestions for growth. If I can add, and Rebecca, you'll back me up on this, but um, it, it's, it's a relationship, right? 100%. We are, you know, they're a private sector company that just released their third quarter earnings, right? They're in a growth stage. People, Wall Street is watching them, right? Um, but I'm, we're bringing public dollars to the table. And so we are putting forth what we think are the outcomes that we want, right? And it's a negotiation, right? Because at the end of the day, um, they're the second company to be operating Blue LA. The first company exited the market globally. It just wasn't in their, in their financial model. It just didn't work. And so there are risks, right? And I think it, it has to be a, a, a give and take, uh, a back and forth. Um, yes, there's a steering committee, 
but it's because we designed it that way. And we pay that steering committee for their community knowledge. And we have a separate line item to pay community ambassadors to do that work. And so those community ambassadors work with Rebecca's marketing and outreach team so that we're in alignment. And it doesn't always go smoothly. But that's the, that's the magic, though. But that, but that is really the, the, the learning and the joint learning that we're doing in order to be effective. And yesterday, um, I participated in, in my staff, my team here um, as part of our steering committee for the CARB STEP project. And um, one of the community members um, had some comments about our open street event, the open street event that's happening in South LA um, later this month or next month. And they had some really strong comments then saying, we don't know, we see the outreach and the postings, but I don't know if that's for my community because what it does is it brings people from outside of my neighborhood into my community. And I don't know if we're doing, if you guys are doing a strong enough job to make sure that the kids are know and the schools and because it's a partnership and it's a, it's a steering committee, um, the person who leads the organization, Ciclovia, was like, noted like let's get to work let's work together and then it came to blue la and i was like oh man what are they going to say <laughs> um and luckily i caught it fast enough because it was in spanish and i spoke spanish and um she's like oh yeah yeah no you guys are good <laughs> and i was like you know i'll um, take that and run with it <laughs> yeah because she was like no i see them yeah. i see who they have i know the outreach ambassadors that they have because they're from the community orgs and they know how to kind of come to us and so i think that's a really important piece of it that it just doesn't happen, you have to design it, right? And you have to fund it, right? That's a super, it's an interesting question too when you think about making sure that a community member can build their li daily travel based on a reliable options that they know are going to be there, like Blue LA and other options, um, while also through other elements of the program, giving them the choice to make the best travel option that works for them. And I think that's a tension that you know we're all sort of grappling with is how to give uh, give folks the maximum amount of choice, but still ensure that the options are going to be there and be there reliably for them whenever they need them. Um, um, I'm, I actually have a question too on 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 that concept though of um, making sure that uh, folks have those choices. Um, so I was curious a little bit about the the actual leaving aside the mobility wallet for now, the other components of the UBM program, and if you could speak to how those options are fitting together and what how are you sequencing those so that they make sense to the community members and don't feel like it's happening to them but happening with them. Um. So just really quickly, a couple of the other elements. It's Blue LA expansion um, into South Los Angeles. Um, it is uh, the launching of an e-bike library, a 250 e-bike library um, for long-term lending, low-income qualifying. Um, there it's uh, EV chargers, um, working with our um, parks and recs and libraries to co-locate chargers um, at those locations. Um, there's a portion of funding that went to uh, the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator and LA Trade Tech for workforce development. Um, I think we, they just graduated their first all women um, EV tech um, cohort training. Um, and again, I think part of that was because as we're talking about a just transition, um, like do people see these technologies coming into their community and are they beneficiaries of that technology? And, um, and, and I think being again intentional about what you're funding as part of a strategy, I think was really critical on that. Um, I think the other elements are, again, we're funding in part the Ciclovia events because we really see it as a, as a kind of a canvas for outreach and engagement to get people engaged in thinking about what it could be. Um, um, am I missing, what else am I missing? I think, I think that's about it, but the sequencing. That's it, it Marcel, so really, that's it? I, th I think it's about capacity. It was, it's really about capacity because we're, we're partnering with, uh, oh, I know, and then we're also, yeah, we're expanding. Oh, Shout out to Connie Jano, who's my boss. She knows. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're expanding um, our on-demand uh, microtransit. Um, so we've tested one in West LA, and um, we're gonna be expanding that program to South Los Angeles. Um, with the caveat being is that it, instead of the vehicle type that we have over there, it's going to be the same size, kind of like a 15-seater, um, uh, but it's going to be electric. Mm -hmm. And so, again, through this investment, working with our vehicle equipment provider, they're like, oh, we don't have those, but we'll build it. 
you know? And so again, we're moving the market um, through these kind of investments. Um, and again, that's LADOT doing that. But again, there's also a very, as you see outside, a very successful metro micro um, on-demand transit program. Again, so again, it's great this, this friendly, um, you know, competition we have about who can be the most innovative or deliver the best service. And so it's great, it's part of the ecosystem. Um, but again, the sequencing is, is, some of it is about capacity. Some of it, as much as we want it to make sense, um, you know, it, some of it is like, when can you deliver that? Because again, we're, we took this project on and applied for it like in the midst of the pandemic. And so um, we're thankful to our staff, you know, the, who's building the capacity and thank, thankful to my leadership um, to help uh, resource us with that this is a priority for us. Um, and so some of it is really, again, like, when do you think you can do that? You know, and really that negotiation with our implementation partners. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, I think it's gonna be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jillian, I wanted to actually bring you in as in thinking about this idea of scale. So the South LA project is a pilot and there's a ton of resources uh, being devoted and, and, and in making sure it's a successful pilot, but uh, communities statewide aren't going to have access to a similar level of resources and certainly not the level of expertise that LA DOT and the city of LA and Slate City are bringing to this. So I'm curious from your work at Caltrans, sort of how are you thinking about the role of the state in standardizing or scaling some of this work and lessons learned from LA and elsewhere? Oh boy, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, well, so if everybody has an account, it makes it easy for us to distribute money, uh, is, is one idea. But um, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm actually having to, th to think about this while I, <laughs> while I answer the question. Um, so l let me think about it. There, what we have right now is a lot of disparate programs in the many different state agencies that have their fingers in some kind of transportation pie. <laughs> and it's sort of my job to ferret all of them out and tell them to get out of that business. Because um, they don't understand what they're doing, they don't understand what payments are, they don't understand what banking is. So I think sort of getting all of the benefits that we're trying, the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, and the money that we have to do them, and lining them all up in one program, or, or, or in an outcome-based program that we work with the private sector on delivering. Because the private sector is way better at delivering accounts than we are. So. Um, we have, for instance, ARB has all this money to help people. Uh, we give people money to buy electric vehicles. I wish we would give them more money to ride transit personally, but that's okay. So, um, uh, but it turns out that a lot of people who are gonna get a used electric vehicle live in a multi-unit apartment building and they're gonna need some place out of their apartment building to recharge it, right? And so already we're starting to see people coming to ARB saying, but I don't have a debit card. How am I gonna recharge the vehicle? So. You know, state agencies are were gonna get they were gonna get into rolling out their own program, issuing their own car, special card just for EV charging. You know, on this program and that program, like that's how you scale it. Is we get rid of all that crap. <laughs> we come up with simpler eligibility verification rules, and we figure out how to dispense the money on a basic account that everybody should have already. Um, and if they need one issued, we'll, we'll figure out a way to issue them an account, right? Maybe some kids, for instance, need, need to have cards issued to them. Um, but I think that's how you scale it. Um, uh, and if you're doing it on the bank rails, that makes it easy to scale sort of globally, frankly. That's how I would answer that. I'm also curious, since a lot of your work started with transit, but you are at Caltrans thinking about integrated mobility broadly, how does this, this sort of idea of scale also apply to other modes and, and thinking beyond just mobility to um, how people pay for all sorts of other kinds of other things in their lives too? Yeah, well, so there's, so if everybody's on the bank rails, you can start to do really interesting things. So I'm always yammering about transit, but um, we see the same problem of the underbanked in, in roads, right? The longest lines for the toll bridges or the longest lines for, for paying lanes are always the cash paying lines. And so now, now we have this very expensive fiction, which is we've removed all the cash, the people that collect the cash, and we just send you a bill that nobody ever pays. But, uh, you know, I, I haven't yet gotten the numbers on how much money we spend taking a picture of your driver's license and then sending you a bill that you never pay. But um, we could probably just get, buy more people, like give them cars for that amount of money would be, <laughs> would, be, would be my guess. But 
If you start to link all these things up, then you can sort of start to nudge. We can use the incentive programs that come on in the debit and credit card system, right? So we're all, all probably used to stuff like, you know, spend money at Avita in May on your Chase card and get 10% off, right? None of our programs are in that. So you can build the incentive programs um, to make the po help achieve the policy outcomes that you want. It also allows private sector, uh, thinking that way also allows private sector actors to engage in a way that they can't today. So you could start to build programs that, I mean, so <clears throat> I know in the Bay Area where I live, making transit free won't make people take it more. You know, the service is not good. That's why people don't take it in the Bay Area. Um, so making it free is not going to make people take it more. But, you know, for certain events and certain things, giving them a free coffee because they took transit will make some people take transit. So, you know, are there more things that we could, like that that we can in do to induce the people, the 97% of Californians who never even think about taking transit, to at least try it once? Speak to them in their language. Um, and working with the payments industry and the banking industry who know a lot more about customers and customer behavior than government ever will, um, we, we maybe have a, have a shot at that. I guess that's how I'd start to answer that question. It's sort of a, um, I feel like, um, you know, there's that character, the, the Robert De Niro character in Brazil at the beginning who comes and like roots through the plumbing and throws stuff out and compares, so that, I feel a little bit like I'm in state government like push, pushing apart the plastic tubing looking for the projects, but anyway. <laughs> Amazing. Um, well, I'm very, very mindful that we're at the end of a qu quite long day, and we are the last thing that stands between you all and a lovely reception outside. So I just wanted to end by acknowledging that the program and the universal basic mobility efforts in Los Angeles is both a research project, as you mentioned, but also a, a program that's truly having an impact on people in South LA. Um, and so I just wanted to, sh as many other cities here uh, online um, and, you know, considering these concepts are thinking about UBM in their own communities. I'm curious for if you, if you could share a few of the sort of best practices or learnings or advice that you can give to other cities as they're thinking about similar efforts. Sure, I'm happy to start with that. Um, so I think that one of the biggest pieces is, is that part around simple communication. You know, how do you actually share it out? And really remembering things that might feel a little bit more analog are going to be really effective for trying to reach low-income populations. So in-person events, really having it be a peer-to-peer -peer share out in terms of the different information ends up being really key. You know, another part is what was also mentioned just in terms of the actual system. Um, as you think about if people are bringing concerns around safety or lighting or other issues, that's going to trump their, that's going to be the most important piece and that's going to trump everything else for them. And that is going to drive their decision making. And so you're also going to at the same time need to address those issues as well and make it clear for the community that you have a pathway for addressing that. Um, so that they feel comfortable utilizing whatever system you're putting in front of them. And I think, you know, that piece in terms of, you know, always having trusted mes messengers and having community members who are really well trained and being able to share out all of this information who can be really honest in their responses. You know, Marcel was talking about, you know, that steering committee meeting and that feedback around one of the, the efforts. You only get that level of feedback when people feel comfortable enough to give you that feedback. Otherwise, they say, this is okay, this is fine, this is okay, and then they go back to their neighbors and they complain about it, and then you hear about it at like a city council meeting rather than in a space yeah, that you yeah. created for <laughs> feedback. Um, so you really have to do a lot of creating a space of shared trust, and the most important piece in terms of that shared trust is that you have to head on address the power dynamics that are in the space because we like to sometimes pretend that they don't exist, they're there, and you have to just address it. So addressing it helps to make sure that we can all move forward because it's been named. Um, but those would be the best practices that I would say. Yeah, yeah I, I echo that. I think, I think the, su the, the success of this program is really rooted in the partnership, right? And being willing to create a space to have those tough conversations. Um, 
you know, I think the other piece that I think is important to know as for, for other um, cities or other states who might be tuning in, um, you know, I, I think a big shot, a shout out goes out to the funding that has been made available um, and this competitive nature. Um, there's nothing, I think everyone is just like, let's roll up our sleeves and like, let's really, you know, try to go after this, you know, get the bag, you know, because, um, and I think kudos to the state for designing um, a, a grant opportunity that really is focused on, you know, serving disadvantaged communities. Um, and that is also giving us the license to innovate and be creative um, and, and learn, right? Some of the work is not, may not be quote unquote a success, but it's how we're learning and how we're iterating um, into the next version of that. That is gonna be important. And you know, I, I think that there's just more resources needed and dedicated to building community capacity around this work. Um, and so I, I think that is something that is an evolving best practice that really needs to, to be lifted up um, because there are other community orgs in the ecosystem who are taking this off, taking pieces of this on, on themselves. And um, it's not just about the advocacy work, but it's all about the operations work around it to, um, as well. And so figuring out that sweet spot between advocacy, um, community engagement, but also operations and really being, this is gonna work and this is gonna be sustainable, I think is gonna be really, I think, a key to success for this type of programs. I think um, I would say that every good program um, that has any hope of being successful has to be really rooted in the listening, um, in the structure, in the beginnings of the programs. Um, and then kind of throughout in its listening, not just, you know, through Blue LA, through our community, um, through our members, understanding our customers, how they want to use the vehicles, but it's in listening to our partners too. What are their needs? Um, and them listening to us what our needs are. And I think if you can listen openly before really jumping in to theories and ideas about what'll work and what not, you are setting the path for success. So don't make assumptions. Uh, I'm going to be the like academic on the team and say that I think a best practice for government officials is to, to read. Um, I think we know very little about the accumulation of wealth. We don't understand wealth and how um, the American financial system works, and that's really to the detriment of our customers. So I would suggest that everybody read The Color of Money, Black Banks, and the Racial Wealth, wealth Gap by Mersa Bar Baradaran and also um, How the Other Half Banks, which is also a book by her. As long as we're talking about the color of things, also read The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, which is about our, our land use policy, which is a big driver of this. Um, and then I would say voraciously read the FDIC's How America Banks report, which comes out every other year, because it tells you a lot about why the underbanked and the unbanked don't have bank accounts and what, uh, you know, what, what are the big drivers of that. And those, it, largely it's about trust, and if you read things like the, co the color of money, you'll understand why a lot of people that we serve in, in the public don't trust uh, wh where they are and they don't trust us very much. So I think that's sort of fund a fundamental best practice is to be informed about sort of our history. Amazing, thank you. Thank let's thank our panelists for an excellent conversation. <laughs> And I know we are at an innovation conference, so I just want to thank each of you for bringing your perspectives and also the putting people and the users at the center of this conversation today. So thank you all for that, and please have a great rest of your evening. And thank you to our moderator. Thank you so much, Lily. <laughs> thank you.